welcome to episode six of The Board. I'm Kirsten Donaldson and this is Paul Flewelling. Hi. We're, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we're here today to talk about the product owner and uh, we've realised that the product owner is a pivotal role within um, a scrum team and um, so we're going to discuss the various, uh, you know, ins and outs of being a product owner. Okay, so we're going to talk about first, Paul. Um, today, okay, so we're, we're going to talk about um, what type of person um, makes a good product owner. Um, so I have some thoughts on this. The product owner needs to be someone who is empowered to take decisions on behalf of uh, their stakeholders. Um, I'd say it needs to be someone who is willing to be somewhat assertive when it's required. Um, they need to be able to stand up to people um, and, and know when to say no. Um, it's a great quote by Steve Jobs actually that kind of sums up this um, saying no. He said, innovation is not about saying yes to everything, it's about saying no to all but the most crucial features. So I think that's really important for people to be able to say that and say it to um, stakeholders as well um, as other people within the organisation and, and possibly even to the, to the Scrum team. So how about what you, what have you found is the sort of personality traits that you think would be suited to a product owner? I think that the, the product owner needs to be highly communicative with the team, so a, they, need, they, need, they need to have collaboration and communication as a, a forte or a strength. Mm-hmm. They, um, they, I, th- I think they also need to be empowered to do their jobs and so when they've got stakeholders behind them, um, they need to listen to those stakeholders but they, they, have to, they have to have the power to make the decision. Yeah, that's right. So um, what, how do you find um, it goes engaging POs in the Scrum process? I, I find sometimes when, you, when you're embarking on a new Scrum project, you might find um, that the person is a little lost at the start if they've not been working with Scrum before. What sort of techniques do, do you employ to help that person uh, become engaged in the project and learn to collaborate with us and, and share with the Scrum team? Well, there's a, there's a number of things. If the, if the product owner is completely new to the role, um, the, there's usually some signs that they're not engaged, and so you can start to encourage them. For example, if they're, if they're not coming to stand-ups and so on, you can explain to them how important it is that they do take take part. You know, it's a it's another conversation for them to have with the team and so on. Um, and, and and so I generally start with some coaching and a full and frank discussion about how important their role is. Um, and then I will spot for warning signs. I know I spot warning signs at various meetings and so on, like the retrospectives. We were talking earlier this morning, Paul, um, about what sort of activities we might undertake at the start of a project to help um, form a, a team that's going to work well together. Um, one thing that I was talking to you about was an activity we did recently here um, called Journey Lines, mm-hmm. um, whereby you ask everybody in the team to sit down and um, map the highs and lows of a period of time in their life. Um, and so we did this recently with a team here and it was really great to learn so much about um, each member of the team in a really short space of time and it really uh, sort of lent itself to creating a, a cohesive team, knowing more about each other and becoming engaged with each other. That's right. Um, so is that something you, you think about trying with a new team? Absolutely, yeah. I saw the power of that the other day when we, we tried it. It was a, a really good exercise. Um, just It seemed to, you know, you just had a, a, a feeling of... Um, bonding with the team that you hadn't had before after that exercise. Yeah, and I think actually some of the journey lines, you know, somewhat revealing about people's um, past and things like that, and I think that really encouraged that, encourages the spirit of being courageous. Um, you know, obviously in a, in a retrospective, um, people need to be brave and courageous, and, and that really helps at the start of the project, sort of getting people used to that. That's right. Um, so we've got a question here, Paul, um, from John. It says, do you see product owners as glorified project managers? Um, in a word, no, no. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, good question though, thanks John. Um, you know, they're not, they're not there to dictate to the team. I mean, generally project managers we've seen on, on waterfall projects in the past are very much um, directing people what to do, when to do it, and where to be and those sorts of things. Um, that's not the role of the, the product owner, it's not the role of the, the scrum master either. Where, you know, the, the whole team, including the product owner, um, are there to work collaboratively. They bring the vision from their side and they provide feedback and, um, and generally just work with the team to produce um, exactly what they want from each story. That's, that's not to say that the product owner won't have a schedule or um, a, a, you know, a release journey in, 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 um, for want of a better word in mind, but it's, you know, they, 
um, they definitely don't fulfil the role of a, a project manager in the traditional sense. Um, they're just inputs and in, um, to the you know, to the team. So, how do you find um, what sort of activities does the, does the product owner do during the course of a sprint um, to collaborate with the team? I can think of some specific examples um, that we were talking about the other day, and I know you're a developer, Paul, as well as an agile coach. Can you tell us a bit about what you do with the product owner? Sure. So, there's a number of conversations we have, um, but one that we've found really um, valuable recently is um, we, we use behaviour driven uh, development and um, we sit down with our product owners and we, we, um, as much as possible and we try to write acceptance tests before we start a new story. And so the acceptance tests take the form of scenarios and um, th it's, it's a way of validating for both the developer and the product owner that they have a, um, a complete and well-defined story. Um, and so we, we often go through the acceptance criteria of that story and we'll, we will write scenarios that match the acceptance criteria and we often at this point, we'll discover new acceptance criteria um, in, in, you know, during that process. So it's really valuable in, in helping that collaboration to produce successful yeah. features. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, we've got another question here um, from John again. Can project managers get agile and morph into product owners? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that being a project manager in a previous life precludes you from becoming a successful um, product owner. Um, I'd say it, it is up to the Scrum team and an Agile coach or Scrum master to, to help that person and, and coach them about you know, successful product ownership. Um, I don't think that, much like Scrum masters, um, product owners aren't born, they're made. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've often found that um, some of the best product owners come from the business side, but they're not necessarily project managers. They are business, you know, they're business savvy. And they have, and like you said before, they have the vision and so on. And they have a, you know, a clear understanding of where they want to go. With that, you know, I, I think um, you don't necessarily. I think it, there's no prerequisites for a product owner, apart from you know the understanding that they they are they're holding the vision. That's right, and and the willingness to work with the team and, and collaborate. What other types of collaboration do you see um, between the product owner and the, the team during the course of a sprint? Well, there's 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 many. Um, obviously, we sit down during sprint planning. We uh, will. It's a very valuable for the product owner to be present during the sprint planning session. There will be conversations around the stories when the team are tasking up stories, when they're sizing stories even, they need the product, they need the product owner present to, to let them discuss. Um, they, you know, they, they may have ideas around how the story is going to be um, completed and so on, and they need to discuss those with the product owner. And, and we find during the course of a sprint that um, we'll often have um, discussions after the stand-up with the product owner about certain aspects of the story as well. So we're really talking all the time, aren't we? That's right, yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons why the product owner does need to be available to the team um, on a regular basis. Um, we're also asking the product owners to, to make decisions very quickly so that the, the sprint um, can continue to progress. Um, so I think that's one of the other things we need to coach product owners on is um, being able to take decisions quickly. Some people find it hard to, they, they think that every decision is um, a dramatic decision. So we like to coach people that um, if you just make it this decision now quite swiftly, um, that's not to say that things might not change later. And so we're really looking at um, responding to change and following a plan and giving them that flexibility and allowing them to, to do that without it becoming a, a major drama. That's right. Not, not to forget, we're also, uh, we're lo also looking to the product owner to um, accept the user stories as they become finished. And, um, and if there's any delay in that for the team, they often, it often drags them back when they start working on another story while they're waiting for the product owner to accept. They often get pulled off that new story back to the story that was finished so that they can complete. Cause there's often um, things that were missed or the things that the product owner um, didn't spot you know, during the first, you know, um, when they were writing the story initially, or the acceptance criteria and so on. So you're saying if the product owner isn't um, able to respond in a reasonable time on accepting stories, then that story could just continue and continue. And then, yeah, and that will delay yeah. the team. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what else we're talking about today? Um, so we've got um, spotting when the uh, PO isn't engaged, for example. Okay, um, so this can be a problem with some new teams and, and new product owners. 
Um, it's a problem because we, we really need to have um, honest feedback and um, you know, in retrospectives, we, we need the product owner to engage and, and participate as much as the team does in order that we can continue to improve um, our processes and, uh, as each sprint goes on. Um, so sometimes you'll find the new product owner, you know, the person may be present, but they may not be contributing as, as much as they could. What kind of techniques do, do you use to um, get that person contributing in a meaningful way? Well, um, the, there is a number of activities that we um, use here to, to try and demonstrate the power of um, um, certain parts of Scrum. For example, if the, if the um, product owner is not participating in the retrospective, or they're present and they're, um, you know, they're on their phone or something like that, mm -hmm. there's, um, there's an activity we use, like the ball game for example, which demonstrates the power of retrospectives and how important they are to the process. And, and, and so we can, we can you know, use one of those activities with the product owner and the team, for example, to, to demonstrate why they should participate. Okay, so we can put up a, a link to the, the ball game after the show if anyone's interested in how that works. Um, it's just basically a, a game that um, runs many sprints with um, retrospectives in between and it really shows people how changing um, the way you're working can improve um, productivity or result of each sprint. So we'll put that out later. Uh, more often than not, the, you know, the, the team will ask the product owner. If they spot that the product owner isn't engaged in the process, they will bring it up during the retrospective. So the key thing is to get the product owner engaged during the retrospective so they can get the team's feedback. So it's also really important for the, the team to be brave during a retrospective as well. Do you ever find that the, the team isn't um, keen to be honest or courageous in front of a product owner? Has that been an issue in the past? Um, or? Certainly, yeah. Certainly teams that are new to Scrum, they find, you know, they, there is a, the, the, the whole transparency thing is new to them and they've never been able to say these things, not out loud at least, or not to the person who's um, um, paying their wages, you know. Mm -hmm. So I guess though, once people do get used to speaking in retrospectives and coming up with constructive feedback, um, and we find that actions are implemented and they see that that actually works and things do improve, that they become more confident yeah. about contributing those retrospectives. Yeah. Um, and so I guess it's the, the role of the Scrum Master to um, construct activities and encourage people to speak um, and make sure it's an environment they feel comfortable That's doing right. so in. Absolutely. So, um, I also wanted to talk today about the. Um, there's a term used in um, um, in Scrum uh, called the single ringable neck, and um, I don't like this term particularly. Um, it's used to describe product owners because it, it's basically saying that the buck stops with the product owner. Um, but I find it quite. Um, I, I, if I was a product owner, I'd find that quite nerve-wracking. That Monica, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be called the single ringable neck. And so, do you think there's better names that we can? you know, use for the product owner to understand their role? Um, I'm not sure I can think of something off the top of my head, but I, but I do think that it's just important to coach the product owner um, that we are actually working as an entire team to produce a product. They're not out there on their own. You know, we're, we all take responsibility within the team um, to produce something. Um, and I think that's something that's really important to get across at the start. You know that we're all there working for the same goal and working together and collaborating to produce something. It's not all on their heads. So um, the concept of you know a, a single ringable neck is um, definitely a misnomer in a scrum team. Yeah, I think. So the alternatives. Um, you know, I was thinking maybe the because they kind of orchestrate the team. You know, the conductor or something. You know, I, uh, we were talking about this yesterday. Actually, and I thought perhaps the conductor was more appropriate to the scrum, scrum master, master yeah. because the scrum master, you know, the team does the work. For example, plays an instrument, um, and the scrum master will guide them much more. Like conductor. So I'm not sure conductor is great for product owner, but nice one for a scrum master, <laughs> I think. So um, maybe yeah. work on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But anyway, not we'll, we'll drop the term single ring on that. I think from our conversations. Um, so what are the common pitfalls of? Um, the product owner should avoid? Um, I, I think a, a really common one is um, having to go back to a number of people back in their organisation to um, take decisions. You know, it's really important at the start to um, have this person understand that they're responsible decision, for decisions. If they're taking a decision back to um, a number of people back in the office, um, that will hold up the, the work of the sprint. Um, you know, there is plenty of opportunity for um, other stakeholders to take a look at the development during the review at the end of each sprint and um, give some feedback and some comments. Um, the, 
you know, the product owner should have um, enough power within the project to make these decisions and keep the sprint going. So I think that's probably the biggest one for, in my opinion. But what other sorts of things have you seen? I, I've seen um, a couple of things. Um, one, they sometimes they push the team too hard, and they're, they're especially around the, if, if there's a deadline approaching or they have a deadline in mind, um, and they often push the team so that we we get this kind of snapback when the team is you know that they've they've produced, they've tried really hard, and then they they go into a lull because they've um, been working too hard over successive sprints, and so their velocity drops and so on, and then. You know, if the if the product owner wants the team to maintain a sustainable pace, then they need to be um, not driving the team as such. So they need to allow that flow to happen. The, the, yeah. Okay. Rather yeah. than putting pressures on at certain points, which yeah. is not necessarily productive. And more often than not, you're focusing on the wrong thing by questioning the team's velocity and so on. You're you're making the team focus on the wrong um, uh, variable within their. Um, within their operation, you know, and they should be focusing on things like quality, for example. Because um, often if they focus on a positive um, variable, they'll, um, they'll up their game and they'll become more productive naturally. Right. So do you think that um, as a Scrum Master or Agile coach, um, your job is to coach the product owner on, on what's productive in terms of looking at velocity exactly. and, and perhaps yeah. keep those conversations a little bit separate if they're trying to, to plan things using velocity? Um, I, th I think so. If, if, if they, uh, if that's their, you know, if, they, if they've, I mean, I don't think there's any harm in bringing it up occasionally or bringing it not, but not to focus it, in, not to make it a part of the um, retrospective mm -hmm. is is a, is a mistake. Mm -hmm. But um, focusing on it, I think, is a bad idea. Right. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, what have you been reading this week? Have you um, <laughs> been seeing any interesting blogs you want to talk about? Or? Yeah, sure. I, I've been reading a lot. Um, by uh, Dan North, his uh, blog is at dannorth.net. He's um, he's the originator of BDD, and um, amongst many other things, he's he's worked for ThoughtWorks and uh, he, he worked for a number of um, trading companies in the UK and so on. And and the his blog his blogs are interesting because I'm from a technical background as well, and he's he's from the same. So mm -hmm. we you know I have some uh, understanding of where he's coming from. Uh, one of the recent blog posts um, was called The Art of Misdirection and um, he makes an analogy to a, to a magician um, when, when you're, when you're uh, watching a magician you're uh, focusing on the obvious and you, you, you miss the sleight of hand that allows the trick to happen and um, he, um, you know, and, and he, he goes on to say about economists and how they um, when you uh, focus on the obvious and you don't you don't allow the opportunities ar um, around the obvious to happen, you, it's called opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. All your money goes on the obvious opportunity, and you don't consider that you know what you could have done with the uh, you know with other paths. Uh, and so he's talking about um, considering your options and considering you know writing down the pros and cons of the way that you're st you're doing things at the moment. And then considering the other opportunities that you have, and writing down the pros and cons of, of, of those opportunities. So perhaps taking it a little bit more time up front to, to think about the best solution as opposed to the most obvious solution. Um, not yeah, sure. Or is that a bit it, simplistic? It's a bit simplistic, but you know you can you can apply it to anything. For example, his, his example is TDD, BDD, um, and you know it, it, his his. Um, aiming to focus people to use BDD in the correct way that's appropriate for their project and not just do it because it's a buzzword or because someone else has had great success with it. Um, he's, 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 you're, you need to focus on why it's good for you and um, what your you know, opportunity is with it. Okay, so um, for people who want to know a little bit more about um, what behaviour driven development is and perhaps um, test driven development, um, there's a couple of blog posts on our, our blog that we can direct you to and we'll include those links after the show um, if you need to know a wee bit more about that. Um, so how about books? I know you read a lot of books on Agile. Um, I, what's the latest? This is um, a current favourite of mine. Um, Succeeding with Agile by uh, Mike Cohn. Um, and I was... Um, I often go to this book when um, he, he's got many... Uh, uh, realistic words to say around using Scrum and how to apply it. And um, 
what I, I was reading the PI section, and um, he does talk about how hard the, the product owner role is. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pivotal role to making the project succeed. And um, he, uh, he, he, he talks um, about the fact that if one product owner is struggling to, to fulfill that role, there's mm -hmm. no problem with um, having a product owner team as long as one of those product owners is the key decision maker or has to, you know, makes the decisions. Okay, so basically they have some support from other people um, in a similar role, but there's still one point of contact for the team. That's right. Is that right? That's right. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I was reading a, a blog this week um, by someone called um, Roman Pitchler. Um, it was a really interesting blog about the product owner's right to say no and using that. Uh, it ended on, on quite a nice um, note, which I'm going to read out now. He says, to find out if you truly own your product, ask yourself, am I empowered to disregard feedback and reject requests? Can I say no even to powerful stakeholders? Exercising agile product ownership requires a positive answer to both questions, which I think is um, really powerful words for, for a product owner to ask themselves. And you know, if the answer is no, then they need to, to find out what they can do to, to, to make it the case that they can't say no to these people. So I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, the product owner role is, um, as we said, is, is a very, you know, it's the key role to making the project successful um, because um, we're trying to avoid the, the um, uh, things that have happened in the past um, where, you know, the requirement driven approach with, um, with uh, Waterfall caused, um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the team to go away and work on something that ne wasn't necessarily wanted. So they, um, the team might go away and, and work for um, a period of time in isolation without input from um, the supplier or product owner, whatever you like to call them, London Waterfall. That's right. And would come back with something that doesn't necessarily reflect um, that company's requirements. So be, be an active and collaborative and communicative product owner. That's what we've found works. Yeah. Okay, um, I think that's, that's it for this week. So um, thanks everyone and hope you'll join us in um, a couple of weeks for episode seven. Thanks Paul.